Um, good day everyone, I'm Dan Hodgen, I farm near Harden uh, and I'm lucky enough to be one of Alliance's 15 pilot farms for the Red Meat Profit Partnership. I didn't come up with the title, Sarah did, but it's actually quite fitting, so um, you'll see we've, as we go through we've made some small changes to what we do, uh, altogether I guess reasonably big, but um, some serious impacts. I don't have to point that do I? Look at that, about us, right. It's not my house. I live on a nearly 100 year old one that's falling apart. That's where my parents live, but I didn't want to show you that one. We farm three, own three properties totaling 535 hectares, all in the upper white catchment. So we are a red zone, which, as we were hearing before, creates some issues, but we're having a bit of fun with that. Uh, we also lease a biodynamic block of 40 hectares from a vineyard next door, which to me, biodynamic, looking at that, seems a very nice way of saying grow stuff all. Um, good at thistles, great place to stick a few single ewes and that's pretty much about it really. But handy over the last few years. We're a good mix of uh, flat, rolling and hill country. So it's uh, predominantly north facing, bit of northwest, uh, but yeah, good, good country. And good and health, north, healthy North Canterbury area, which as we all know is a nice way of saying it's bloody dry so the worms don't survive. Um, we're around 5,000 stock units, used to be slightly more with cattle but, uh, but the droughts dealt with that. Uh, so now all sheep, pretty much a few half ass pet cows and cow, um, a few, a uh, little bit of dairy beef that we're having a bit of a play with but only a handful. Uh, relative, relatively conservative approach and I think in our area that's quite important. You can get pretty big fluctuations in seasonal growth and things like that. So. I wouldn't say we're very conservative, but we're relatively conservative. Our, our, our main aim is never to jeopardise what we've got um, by taking too big a risk. Benchmarking at the start of the project put us in what they call the third quintile, which is a really nice way of saying your average, somewhere between 40 and 60%. So, probably not too bad. Um, unlike 70 something percent of farmers when Deloitte did their study, we, weren't, we didn't think we were in the top 25%, which was quite an interesting concept. Uh, and it's a family business, so my parents um, and my sister are all involved daily. We all work together every day, all involved in decision making, um, and, and it works quite well. And we're training the next generation with a bit of free labour, uh, to varying degrees of success. <laughs> what we were doing before the project, we thought we were taking along quite nicely. Um, we were lambing early, which was great in our area, we'd get rid of, get rid of the lambs. Um, by the time it gets too dry, uh, started drafting in early November, skim drafting, or depending on the season, we might might start weaning moles. We don't hold to one weaning date. That's, it rolls through for about a six week period. All lambs were being finished to 18 kilos plus average. Um, most years, uh, every so often there'd be a few stores go, or we might sneak down to 17.8. But good heavy lambs, um, and our, our drafter was fairly complimentary of them. Fair bit of summer rape going in to finish those tailing lambs that didn't meet um, weights at weaning. Uh, and those lambs would normally be gone by the end of January, as you'll see later on. Uh, and then we'd turn our attention to the ewes and we'd flush them with a bit of barley to try and make up for how poorly we'd treated them through the summer. Working hard to keep costs as low as possible. I imagine this sounds probably pretty similar to what a lot of people are doing. Um, but it didn't seem to be out of the box. We were approached by a draft to, do, uh, to have a look at this pilot program and um, I was sceptical to be honest I'm not a big one for putting myself out there with these sort of things but uh, and, and none of us are we just like to tick along and do what we do. Um, initially three options what you could look at genetics was the first one we sort of thought oh we'll have a crack at that we've been working for seven or eight years to try and we tried a number of different options with buying new lambs different breeds, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and we figured, eventually we figured, well, we're actually doing that already, so we can probably get a little bit of advice along that, of that on the way. Second option was fodder and pasture improvement. Same deal, we'd been ticking along. We'd got the three or four pasture species we were pretty happy for, pasture mixes. They were starting to work all right. Um, so uh, what can they help? Third was the whole farm system, which was where we actually landed in the end, probably almost by default. But when we were first talking about whether we do this or not, 
The big thing that I liked was that they came out and they said full funding with partial repayment for any required plant or equipment depending on how long we stuck with it. If we stayed in for one year, we paid 60% back. Stayed in for two, we paid 30% back. Stayed in for three, we got to keep it. So I'd imagine this is the same as every other of the 75 pilot farms. The mine started to boggle. I always sort of thought one of these 30 odd grand, well I don't really want to pay for it, we'll see whether they can. Then it went a bit further, how the hell can we put one of them to use? Bit of a stretch but I thought we could swing it. Then it just went nuts. It was um, away we went. <laughs> Bloody sure these things would be useful. Now they must have got wind of this somehow because that came with a big red mark. That was a no go. So now we have to justify anything and they'll partially fund it depending on what we're doing. The first step we did was to get a fresh, fresh, someone else to come and have a fresh look at what we were doing and we pulled in Jansen Travis, who many of you will know. Uh, he used to actually work for Beef and Lamb. Um, he looked at it and he said, you're finishing all your lambs but it's coming at a cost. Okay. Replacements are suffering and not reaching their potential. Hard to argue with. Ewes were never getting a break and a chance to recover, so they were, at weaning, they were stuck out on a dry block to, to harden off, I guess we used to term it justified as. And uh, when they came back in, they just, they were slowly creeping backwards. The percentages were dropping, a few percentage points every year. And our pastures weren't doing that well. We were starting to get some traction, but because we were always on top of the feed from, I suppose, from August right through, they just, they just never got a break. So with him we, we jumped into this whole farm system. The first step was to bring him in six times a year, so every two months we're actually meeting him next week to go over the, the end of the year and to, to work out the next couple of months. Um, that's worked really well. I was always sceptical, like probably a lot of you are. Why the hell would you be a farm advisor if you know everything, be a farmer? I guess I've got to eat my words on that, but um, he does know his stuff. Uh, this is one challenge I do see with this though, is that whether there's enough of this sort of expertise at that sort of level, but that's something for the industry to deal with as well. So his first idea was an aggressive lamb sales policy. Some of you may have seen his presentations that he does. He has a lovely big graph, it says break the cycle, sell everything at weaning, store or fat, get rid of it. Uh, especially in our situation, because we are weaning in November, there's a good demand for store lambs. Um, and it's hard to grow feed from then on. Someone else takes them to their problem, it's great. Weight targets and monitoring for replacements, something we'd always sort of thought about. We'd weigh the hoggets every so often, and, but never really put a structured plan around it. And this, I think, was probably the big one. Condition scoring a use. Now, we don't sit there with a pad and go one, two, three, four, five. It's bloody quick. It's hand on. She's good enough, she's not. That's it. Draft them off. Um, we aim to take about 10% out any time we do it and they're taken out and given priority feeding. So that's done at weaning first, then again in January, February. Ram harness is on and, uh, at, at mating is the next step he pushed. Again, all around tailoring feed, saving feed. Um, once a ewe's been marked, she's taken out and put, it on, put on maintenance. And, Again, as you'll see some from, from some figures later on, that's been quite effective. And the next one, which we were probably the most sceptical about, was this fodder beat buddy lark for ewes. Again, I'll eat my words, it's, um, it's working quite well. And just as an aside, we did a whole farm soil test, which was something I'd wanted to do for a fair while, but I didn't want to stump up the six grand, so um, we managed to get them to pay for it, which was fantastic. Uh, and some surprising results. So uh, aggressive lamb drafting, that's, that's where it started. It, it's breaking a bit of a cycle, particularly if you use aren't in optimum condition going into lambing because you're going to struggle and you're going to end up with more in the storm side. Jensen's observations, again, back this is jumping back a bit, but of what we were doing, these are his words. Um, a focus on a high lamb carcass weight is increasing demand on summer feed reserves and having a ne negative impact on the feed available to use. Typically early lambs fetch a premium over later season lambs, so sell a little bit lighter, go a little bit harder and, uh, and you'll end up about the same. We always thought if it dropped, schedule dropped 10 cents a kilo in the spring we could keep up with that, 
perhaps stay a bit ahead of it. Somewhere between 10 and 20 would be about break even. And if, as some of the meat companies like to do, whack 30 cents of it out, out of it a week, then it uh, wasn't worth hanging on to them. And it goes without saying, but the property experience of summer dry periods and retaining lambs to heavier carcass weights puts pressure on the feed available through this period. I think anyone on the east coast of the South Island knows that. So the main target for us at weaning now is 70% of lambs available for sale prime off mum. Um, that's, that's where we're hitting. Uh, we've actually achieved that. But um, we reduced the live weight at pre-weaning or at weaning drafts to 34 kilos. We were sometimes 36, 37. Uh, we actually took that a step th further and anything between 32 and a half and 34 is taken out separately for the drafter to stick his hand on. And uh, this year we'll have some fairly solid discussions about him guaranteeing those even if he picks them wrong. So whether we'll get there or not, we'll let you know. Uh, store lambs early and take advantage of that premium. Uh, it wasn't quite as apparent last year because the $2.50, sort of 240 $2.50 stayed right the way through. But the previous year certainly uh, we started at two forty five and dropped to $1.80 and even at $1.80 some of them were tough to get rid of. But expected outcomes, and this is just a bit of brainstorming, I didn't believe this for a second. Um, total lamb revenue to stay in line with selling heavier lambs later. Bullshit. No chance. But we'll let you put it in there Jansen because we're not paying you. Reduced feed demand during a period, feed supply is typically tight due to dry conditions. Again, oh, that bit's obvious, um, although we did turn that into extra money through the replacements and, and the ewes. More feed available for ewes. And in a good season, which we're all sort of starting to forget what that's like, but uh, surplus available for harvesting a supplement or for trading stock, but uh, everyone else wants them now that it's rained, so <laughs> we're not going there at the moment. So how do we go? This is where it gets interesting. Well, I reckon it does anyway. The uh, the green lines are 2013, 2014. I don't know whether is that, that's big enough you can see it. So running up through there, um, fairly low, flat, well, even sales profile. The yellow is uh, the 2015-16 season. He hasn't quite got round to putting the 16-17, despite him telling I, uh, me telling him I quite like it for this, but uh, it's actually more towards November, significantly more towards November. Um, and no lambs left after January, which is, in our situation is really, really useful. 2015-16, we hit 73.9% sold prime off mum, which I don't reckon is a bad result. Um, last year, again, spring was pretty tough last year, but we still hit 72%. Um, and, and I'm picking this year because of partly the fodder beak, um, a lot of feed savings through different actions, I'm picking we're probably going to beat that again. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, all the stores were sold at Wanning, so November or December, whenever their, their mob rolled around. And Jensen worked these out, so I'm trusting that he put these right. He used last 2015-16 uh, schedule as a baseline took the sales profile from the previous two years and worked out what the lambs would be worth. Now, the 16.3, you see the effect is in store lambs, so that's working on an average carcass weight based on live weight for those store lambs. So as you can see, we dropped 80 cents on that year, but we were actually better than that year. And when you come across here, the really exciting part is how much feed we would have required to take these lambs through to those weights. 95,000 kilos of dry matter in summer when we struggle to grow it. It's uh, very useful. Outcomes and observations, no drop in lamb value. Well, that was where I had to start putting sauce on my hat and eating it because I thought there was no way, but he showed it. This again was interesting. Even with the condition scoring, there was a reduced workload. We weren't mucking around with those tail end lambs at weaning. We weren't drenching everything, spraying everything no crutching in January, shearing, and, and probably most importantly, none of those losses, if they died, they were someone else's. So it wasn't, our, it wasn't a big deal. Well, it wasn't our worry, probably theirs, but they're good, good lambs if anyone wants them this year. 
massive feed savings, you know, 60 to 95,000 kilos of dry matter, that's, that's significant. That's, to me, that's huge. Uh, Sandra, I think, worked that out in, the, in your book, somewhere in a book that came out. At, what do we talk for dry matter, 18 cents, 20 cents, somewhere around there? Uh, in summer, if you wanted to find that, it would all be supplementary, so it's probably closer to 40. That's, um, that's a big number. And the feed priority changed to the ewes. Ewe lambs first, tutu second, and those light ewes that we're taking out below condition score three approximately. Surplus feed into hay and baleage, we haven't quite got there yet, but we'll, one day, one day. And we kept growing the summer rate, and that now goes into the replacements instead of, the, instead of those tailing lambs. The condition scoring me and measuring that the hoggets and the tutus are weighed because you can still work on their weights, so I'm told. Uh, they, have, they have a series of targets every two to three months, um, which the first year they weren't meeting, the second year they did. Hands-on condition scoring, anything lighter removed and preferentially fed. I, I, I always used to think you could just run them off at the gate and, and maybe straight off the shears some people might be able to. Um, it, it's better than doing nothing but sticking your hand on them can be quite surprising. And we, I reckon we can get through quite comfortably, I haven't actually measured it, but it's somewhere between five and 800 an hour doing that. So it's pretty quick, it's not a big job. Um, if you wanted to muck around them, one, two, three, four, five, it'll take a fair bit longer to record it all and work it out. And if you're not sure how to do it, which I imagine a lot of you are, talk to Beef and Lamb because they have a pretty good resource that um, lines it up pretty well. Although I see it's not on the table today, which is surprising, James. Again, so outcomes and observations from 2016, 17. So this is at the end of our first year in this program. Huge feed saving year round. We're only giving the lighter use the extra feed. Now you will have, I imagine, all heard this from vets. It takes three times as much dry matter to regain condition as it does to maintain it. So if you drop condition, you might be saving a kilo, but it's going to cost you three to put it back on. Um, young stock vastly improved, and that, and that season the hoggets averaged 48 kilos at the start of April. So we were pretty happy with that. Um, as it turned out, it stopped raining somewhere in February, and it didn't start again until the end of May. So we, we made the decision to pull the pin on hogget mating, which is one of our, our pressure relief valves. Tudus, they weren't so great. These were the ewe lambs that had come through in the first year of the old program. They were 56 at mating, and as you can see, 125% with 13% dries. It was pretty disappointing, um, but we knew why. Uh, it was pretty obvious. Mixed age ewes were healthier. Scanning jumped from 151 to 125, uh, from 125 the year before, which was, we were pretty chuffed. It was pretty outstanding, and in a drought, remember. This is in a drought. And the dry rate in the ewes dropped to 4% from about 55 despite those difficult conditions. It equated to 703 extra lambs from 159 extra ewes, which is not to be sneezed at, uh, especially when you think there's not a lot of extra cost, if any, going into those. This year, the hoggets were 51 kilos at mating, and we did mate them. Uh, these are Jansen's figures again. He's expecting a 90% lambing from them, which will be interesting but he's worked that back from what the Tudus have done. So the Tudus jumped from their 120, well they were a bit lower than their 125 actually, to, um, and 13% dries to 165% and 3% dries, which again, pretty outstanding from condition scoring and weighing a few times. Uh, and the ewes dry rate dropped to 3% as well. The dry ewes, that was another particularly when they're paying for them. The dry ewes, when we sent them to works, averaged just under 31 kilos, which put them over 120 bucks to us. So good payback. We didn't get a lamb, but we still got some, a nice check for them. The mixed age ewes at 161 and a half. The aim's 175. That's, Jensen wrote that. Mine's 170. So if you talk to some of the others in the partnership, they're closer to 150. But we'll just see where we get to. Uh, but again, that's, so that's 161 from 125% two years ago, again in a drought. Forecast, that's 1,350 extra lambs from 274 less ewes, although we are now mating the hoggets this season. So 
Jensen's put that value at about $100,000 net to us. So that's an increase in two years. Um, I haven't spent it yet, but I've got some ideas. <laughs> Again, I have to apologise, this was Jensen's headline. This was uh, with the harnesses, out with the new and in with the old. Uh, years ago, everyone used to use them. Now we sort of go away from them. I don't know why. I don't know why we never used them. They're all marked, 10 day periods. Once they're mated, removed from the mob. Gives us a better allocation in autumn when feed again is generally quite tight, or early autumn, so we're talking March here. The lessons from it, 10.6% of the, the ewes were marked in the first 10 days. We thought, bugger me, we're in trouble here. Um, the ewes just aren't doing it. 75% were hit in the next 10 days. Again, bloody surprising. But what that meant was that set stocking, 90% of the ewes didn't need to go out. We could save the, the set stocking feed for 90% of the ewes for an extra 10 days. And again, lambing in the middle of August, that's quite a lot of feed because you're not growing much. Another part with the whole farm soil test, so I did manage to convince them to pay for them, which was great. Well, actually, Ravensdown, Ravensdown chipped in with five, which was bloody good of them when we bought a, paid for 100. Um, we found that 250 of the 480 hectares had an Olsen P level over 20. So the blanket maintenance just didn't seem to stack up. Normally we'd chuck on 180 kilos or about of sulphur super 30, um, but the sulphur levels weren't too bad either. They were, they were surprisingly good. So we decided we'd put this to use. We'd target anything under 15 with 300 kilos, which was designed to bring it up six points. 15 to 20, got a dose of sulphur super, a bit below what normal maintenance would be, but, but from what we were told, still enough to keep it ticking over. And anything 20 plus P was just left alone. So 250 hectares didn't see a truck, but that was good. Now, remember we've spent 6,000 on these soil tests, and that's the difference between the two recommendations of what we would have done, just blindly throwing maintenance on, and what we did with a targeted $7,500 after the cost of the soil testing. Now, it's not something I'd recommend you do every year, but, but it is certainly a tool that's quite useful. Uh, plus, we would have actually got a better response from a lot less super. And, and when we start talking about this environmental thing, fertiliser use is going to be one that they start hammering us with. Uh, if we're putting phosphate onto a high phosphate soil, they're not going to like it much. So, key outcomes. And I found that... Can you read that? It's time we face reality. We're not exactly rocket scientists. I'm not a rocket scientist. I'm, as you saw, we're, we're average farmers. Uh, anyone can do what we can do, or a plan that works for them the same as what we've done. Outside advice can be worth having. I, I wouldn't have believed it five years ago, but never mind. More lambs from use, less ewes. Well, that's not a bad result. A lot of feed saved in summer and again in autumn. It ensures better replacements, and as you see, you, you feed them and they'll perform a lot better. Uh, harnesses save feeding at both mating and lambing, and, and significant feed. And this, again, is one where we've, we've probably had this rammed down our necks. Maintaining new condition is key. It, it, it drives performance, it really does. Uh, again, every kg of dry matter saved by feeding below maintenance requires three kgs of dry matter to recover. It's a bloody expensive way of saving money just doesn't stack up. And the big one, $100,000 of net, extra net income in two years during drought. I think that's pretty cool. Um, that's a pretty good result. And, and we've still got another year to go, so who knows what will happen. That's Jensen's picture. I think that's one of his friends. So, <laughs> Any questions? Start with Don. We just we just get your audio there. Are you applying any in fertilizer? Uh, we did we didn't this year. We did last year, but only small amounts. I think we might have done three or four ton, and and late autumn because we didn't get that rain till May, so and a little bit in the spring, but not a lot. Um, if we get it right, we're we're pretty close. It's a tool worth using, but uh, not as a, not as a plan. Cool. It's closer down. 
And congratulations, Dan. It's um, really great to see the, you know, how the little impacts, what you term little impacts, do have a big impact. And, and I congratulate your family on how you've tackled it. Thanks, Jane. Um, have Ravensdown run those figures through uh, um, Overseer for you and shown you the differences in that leaching? Because I know that's another added cost that everybody's got to do, and it would be good to actually see the implications following through. Um, I think you probably know my opinion of Overseer, and it's worth, Janet. <laughs> so, so no, no, they haven't. They haven't. But, but um, thoughts on Overseer aside, it's the only tool that we've got, and it's a compliance thing in a lot of areas now. So, being able to show how by not putting it on, you can actually improve your losses is actually beneficial in helping to tell that story. Yeah, yeah I don't know what it would show. I mean, we still sit at five or four point six, so there's. There's not a hell of a lot of room there to, um, but that's kgs of N if you don't understand, which I'm sure you all do now because you're donkey deep in this environmental stuff. Um, there's not a lot of room to improve it. Uh, I, I doubt that would have any impact. Cool. Any more, any other questions? I've, I've got a whole bunch myself. But, uh, no, okay, Dan, I'll just, uh, <coughs> so in terms of the RMPP program, We've been studying what's going on in the farmers' minds rather than actually what's happening on farm per se. So it's it's easy to look back at it now and go, oh, yeah, I've made hundred thousand extra or whatever. What it must have been difficult right at the start to be prepared to let go of some stuff that you've done for a long time and I guess go with Jansen's. Jansen, just talk us through that a bit. Yeah, it was. And and look, I'll if I'm totally honest about it, I'd say the drought probably had a, had a big impact on how hard we got it into this. Um, you know, nothing we did was going right anyway, so let's try something a little bit different. Um, we were dubious at the start, but it was more an attitude of can this really hurt? It's, and, and Jensen has a bloody good way, and I think this is something we need more of in our industry, of, of actually explaining to you, and well, he's, he's sort of farm advising for dummies, really. It's, um, he, he really does put it well. Um, so would that be fair? You can comment if you like. It, was, it wasn't It was hard to get so into it, was it? So he called them um, tweaks? Tweaks, yeah. yeah. And they probably were, but the result was a lot bigger than a tweak. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so he talks about tweaks to the business, and, it, and it, we would have had to sell those lambs early that year anyway, so it didn't make a huge difference. And from there, things just sort of seemed to evolve. Yeah. It, it, it's. I mean, the, the farm advisor relationship, and I imagine some of you have got them, but it's about finding the right person that you get on with and that you feel that they believe in your business and what you do and understand why you do it as well. That's a big part of it. And, and we, we, we were lucky. We got that. We got offered a list of, well, we actually got told we could find an advisor and we put through two or three names forward and none of the others would have us, so we ended up with him. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's interesting that that whole concept of um, trusted professional or trusted advisor has been a really strong theme that's come from farmers and, and, and you'd all know there's people you actually trust and, and those that you don't. So I just sort of wonder, can, can you sort of just maybe give us a bit of an understanding around what, what was it around maybe Travis's approach that meant that you could perhaps trust what he's saying rather than, uh, you know, you hadn't done some of that stuff before? He just, I don't know, he's a straight shooter. There's no bullshit. Am I allowed to say bullshit, yeah, James? <laughs> There's no bullshit with it. He's, he talks in a, in a language you can understand. And I mean, we're very big on that relationship. We, we've had the same drafter for 15 years, mm. um, same technical advisor with Farmlands who's just left and gone to another company and we've gone with him because we deal with him. We, we're big on those relationships and that trust because it's an important part of what we do. Mm. Um, and, and he just fit that mould. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, certainly not to say there's not others that would work better with other people, but he yeah. worked for us. So, yeah. so it's a hard one to really put your finger on, but it just felt right. Cool. So, Has anyone got a couple more questions yet? Sorry, just... At the end of the funding, will you um, still get Jensen to help you? Will yes. you? Are you willing to pay for his services yourself? Absolutely, absolutely. That's, that's already been discussed, that's a no-brainer. Just got one. Just one over the back there. Hi, Dan. Turn it on, Chris. Is it on? Yeah. Yep. Um, how are you working your photo beat with the ewes 
all the use going on, et cetera, or part of, or? Yeah, they are. Um, I, I asked about 25 different people how they do it and then sort of picked the eyes out, I guess, for what suited me. But it's, so they get a five day break. Um, the, the first couple of days they go on, they're getting good leaf, so they reduce baleage. The last three days we up the baleage and, and on for two to four hours, depending on, well, really depending what else is going on. Once we get to the end of that break, the, the gate may stay open longer, but um, more baleage. And uh, yeah, it just seems to be working well. They, they, they go nuts for it. Um, if I've got the kids with me, we go out and kick 50 or 100 bulbs out and throw them on the back of the ute, spread them around the paddock when they go off. We did that from the start and that got them onto it pretty quickly. Um, wouldn't recommend it. Actually, Mum said to me, we were talking, because we're not going to get through the fodder bit, so we were talking the other day and we were kicking a few out and throwing them on the back of the ute. She said, this isn't too bad. We've got school holidays coming up. I could, uh, I could grab the kids and we could just do the paddock. And <laughs> it's five hectares and when we got the um, test done, we had a bulb count of 77,000. So I pointed out to her that this is a little bit over 350,000 bulbs. It might take a while, but throwing a few over the fence wasn't too bad. So getting them onto it was... Easy enough doing it that way. But when did you start that though? Uh, when did I start that? What are we now? Uh, it, they've been on for about a month now. Um, they were probably transitioned sort of for four or five days. Before scanning? Uh, no, after scanning. So uh, normally I'd split them up, but because I've got this big paddock of fodder beat and I'm not going to get through it, I figured I'll just leave them together for the time being. Yeah, Dan. Um, I'm just, James. this is probably for Richard a wee bit which gets you off the hook, but you said yourself you wouldn't have done any of it if you had to pay for it for a start, and you might have changed your tune now, but within reason you wouldn't have, you haven't made radical changes, but even small ones are a bit hard to swallow if they cost money up front. So the question for Richard is, if it's this, if there's this much potential from simple tweaks to most of our systems, how are you actually going to scale up the success that you've had with Dan and Mike and the rest of the family? and make it accessible, because the other thing Dan said is that everyone's got a different, um, this won't work for everyone, we'll all have a slightly different thing we need to do that's going to set the world alight for us, but um, yeah, if you could do it for everyone it would be great, so how are you going to do it? I'll take the heat off you for a bit Dan. Well um, actually, just before you do jump in, I would say with this, this is, this is a system that's been specifically designed for us, there'll be bits and pieces out of it that'll work for others, but, yeah. but um, that, that Fresh set of eyes is probably the key to what we've done. That's the key message to get across that tweaks make a big difference, or can make a big difference. So if I could package Dan and take him everywhere, it would be perfect because what he has described today, we've seen frequently across the pilot farms, 75 pilot farms, and <clears throat> the big change in success hasn't come through massive you know, introduction of a widget and a silver bullet. It's actually been through small tweaks that is focused primarily on feeding your stock well and getting the timing of your decisions right, which is not very sexy anymore. You know, I was having a discussion with Kerry Harmer just before around, I think maybe as an industry we've got too sidetracked with kind of the new latest things and actually if we do the basics well, which is what Dan said and what we've seen with the research across these pilots, that's the core of success. Now, scaling that up, what, what's kind of been driving or supporting Dan's success? He's had, he's had adoption support and he's had expertise right at the point of need. And so when we think about how do we scale us up, we want to make sure that those two opportunities are available to sheep and beef farmers across New Zealand. And farmers know by and large what your system needs, or you can certainly test the advice that's coming in, into you. You know your soils, you know your climate, you know your stock and so on. So it's actually how, how, do you, how are you kind of empowered to make smart decisions with the best opportunities. So, so in terms of scaling up, and we, we're actually moving from, the pilot's got one more year to run, but we're, we're moving towards what's called rollout over the next six months as a test phase, and then nationally in, in January next year, where we're actually looking to establish farmer groups, a network of farmer groups around New Zealand, and then those farmers come together, and you decide where your vision is for your businesses, and where there's a shared vision, then actually we'll pull those groups together and provide the support around um, accessing the, the Jan Travises of this, Jansen Travises of this world with, with people who can actually facilitate those farmer groups. So, so we currently have farmer discussion groups around New Zealand, but we're talking about a whole lot of support wrapped around our traditional, I guess, a farmer discussion group type network. And um, 
we've seen that across other pilots. So Dan's been an individual farmer, haven't you? Rather yeah. than in a group. Yep. So so we've seen a, we've we've run a number of farmer groups around New Zealand, which are, which we have largely seen similar success. So the farmers have determined the priority, the focus, and then we've just made sure that there's been the expertise to support those new ideas into practice. And we think it's very scalable, and um, and we, we're actually really excited about it. So we're just building the the kind of the in, internal systems that will support doing this nation uh, nationwide. Uh, sorry, Dave was next, Kerry. I was just interested, Dan, if you're doing anything with the, um, see if the repeat offenders for the lighter use, are you identifying them and, and do they go to a terminal sire if they're, you know, like sort of a single, a single ewe becoming light probably should be straight to a terminal sire or more drastic? No, we, we haven't and the reason for that was, again, trusting what Jansen said, he said there's, there's no evidence of repeat offence and trials that have been done. Um, tomorrow these guys are going to, or next week when we sit down, the proposal for the third year is to finally get my handler and, and EID a fair number of ewes and, then, and look at that sort of thing. I think we can get some pretty cool learnings out of it. Um, working with one of your farmer councillors, new program he's designed hopefully. So uh, yeah, fingers crossed. So that's why I'm here today. I don't really want to do this, but I figure the more of this I do, the closer I'm going to get to that, and they might pay a bit more for it. So. <laughs> Kerry, um, yeah, I I had sort of two questions in mind. The first one's a practical one. Uh, once you've got your colours on your ram harnesses, you know you've got your your mobs, you've got a mob of blues, yellows, whatever. Uh, what are you doing management-wise from there on with them? We actually share in May, which makes that a bloody nightmare, so they've got to stay on until scanning. But um, uh, no, just an aerosol mark on the shoulder for those, and then um, they're all still, once everything's done, they run back together. We're, uh, and then at shearing, we actually share them as mobs, run them back in and replace those dots, which was quite interesting. Um, I said to the kids when they were helping me do it, one day, can you run into the shed and find me a bag of red dots and a bag of blue dots, which took them 15 minutes to come back without them but um, yeah so not ideal but but it works so. um, and if I'm allowed my second question was going back to the um, the use of advice thing um, with hindsight which is a wonderful thing at the beginning you as as, um, as has been said by James you probably weren't prepared to pay for uh, an expert to come in and help and you and you couldn't necessarily see the benefit. Now you've got the benefit, how do you get people to, and how would you approach going out and asking for help now? And what's the value of that to your business? Well, you can see the value of it to the business at 100000 I mean, Jansen, his cost to RMPP, I understand, is about $8,000 a year. So it's not it's not huge, um, especially if you're going to get a tenfold return out of their advice. Um, how would I pick? You mean how would I pick who I was going to deal with, or how, how would you decide? Oh, sorry. What would be the deciding factor that would make you, not having been involved in the program, to actually go out and get somebody to help you? Oh, I think we all we all strive to move forward and achieve, and I guess that's the next step for many of us is to actually get a fresh perspective. Um, but you wouldn't have done that if you hadn't been involved in this, would you? Oh, possibly not. No, no, possibly not. Um, I guess the last three years I've been involved with a lot of these people doing a lot of drought seminars and bits and pieces, so actually started to realise that they're not complete muppets, which has been useful. Uh, but of course, everyone doesn't have that luxury. So, yeah. And my point, um, Dan, just following on from that, was um, my thinking about um, how has it changed your motivations, not just with you, but within your family? Um, because that's the point. Um, all, all your people that are in the room are the ones that will pick up and run with this, but what about the ones that aren't? So, And, and yep. particularly those that struggle motivation-wise at the moment and coming through the drought and that sort of, you know, all the stresses you've had. Yeah. Look, the first year we embraced it, but probably not as much as we could have, and, and we were like just about every other North Canterbury dryland farmer in that everything we touched turned to shit. And nothing worked, it didn't matter what it was. So um, this gave us a bit, a, a, a bit of a sense of purpose again, and a bit of optimism, um, a bit of enthusiasm, um, and, and certainly helped from that point of view. Um, and, you know, seeing the figures at the end, the outcome, uh, the 
the journey's a big part of it. I mean, that 100,000, it sounds great, but at the end of the day, we've got three partners, and as we like to say, we take tax off and split three ways, so we get bugger all anyway, but um, it, it's, yeah, it's still pretty cool. That'd be fair. Do you want to, yeah? It's been quite good, hasn't it? It's good for me. Yeah. <laughs> Did you, did you manage to record that, or does he need to say it again with the microphone? <laughs> yeah, Dan, um, I'm just wondering, the 100,000, I missed where a lot of that was coming from. It's a naming percentage, and was there a value put on the 50 to 90 tonne of feed? No, no, that's not counted, because that's, um, that's extra lambs. So it's just extra lambs, without extra cost. And, well, the actual figure was closer to 120, but we took a bit off for the fodder beat and being conservative. So. Um, just with your um, dropping your weaning weight down to 32 to 34k, are you doing anything, you know, improving the genetics, like with higher yielding sort of type animals, or what's the story there? No, about six years ago we shifted to um, Meadows Lee, so we, we run a Kelso Romney cross, um, and I guess we've been seeing that come through. They, they do, and... Um, are they still allowed to call them Kelso Rangers or Kelso Terminals? I'm not sure where that argument is at the moment, but um, with their, their terminals as well. And they do, they do yield well. The other thing I like is that the maternals aren't far behind the terminals. Um, the 32 to 34 kilos, or 32 and a half to 34, that's, that's down to the drafter. He, he has to pick which ones of those he wants and which he doesn't. Um, so that's not a, just a blanket that they're thrown in. So do you weigh them all at weaning? Or Everything's just... weighed, yeah. Yeah, it is. And then the next stage, so 26 to, to whatever doesn't go big enough, goes store, and then no one seems to want stores at that time of year under 26, so we, I think we held on to about 70 or 80 out of 4,000 or something, um, and sold them very early January. Okay, I've got another question. Um, so you talked about you benchmarked your business. How important was that actually in this whole process? I don't know that it was massively important for me. Um, I think where it'll be really important will be to where, where we benchmark next year uh, at the end of the program. Um, it was interesting, but while in the past the parents had been in that top bracket, we were fairly confident we weren't. Uh, it was nice to see that we weren't at the bottom 10% either, but um, yeah, it, wasn't, it wasn't massive. It was a but it is benchmarking, so yeah. Uh, any, any more questions? You mentioned the um, your handler with the EIDs and the skinny ewes. What what other um, benefits do you think you've got with EID and sheep? Oh, it's just actually knowing exactly what they do year on year. Um, some of the things like Dave mentioned with repeat offenders on those light, uh, into those light mobs, whether that is a repeat, even if it is only 10 or 20%, they're probably still worth chucking out, if you can. Um, and then I guess it goes from there, I don't know. I, I, I can see opportunities with it, that's for sure, but uh, you're not gonna get the full opportunity out of it unless you're actually carrying on that generational run, but um, there's certainly stuff to find out. Information's power. Just another question for me, Dan. Um, you mentioned that, uh, you know, like, so getting rid of the lambs, you had a lot more free time and all that. How much do you think that the extra petrol you've got in the tank now, as far as just the fact that you're not so busy, the farm's going well, all that allows you to, A, have a better quality of life, or B, focus on expanding the business or doing something different, or even just having family time? How much of a value do you think because that's, that's the undollar value that you're also picking up here. Yeah, unfortunately for the last couple of years I've probably diverted that into other, other pastimes through drought committees and all that sort of carry on. Now that it's rained, um, I think that'll be pretty useful. I mean, during January now we're committed to 
condition scoring a mob, weighing a mob, and and uh, shifting sheep really, which is which is quite nice. So it will be useful as long as it doesn't go back to another drought. Although it must be someone else's turn. Righty, you'll be keen this year, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> so we need to wrap things up now. So. So I just uh, re-emphasise, uh, so in terms of the RMPP program, if you're interested, you've liked what you heard, which I suspect is the case, then make contact with your meat company and, and just flag with them that actually you're keen to get involved in an RMPP group and, um, and some of those will be starting off in this phase one, but certainly the start of next year and oh, late, late this year, but into, into action on the, in the January period, there'll be, a, I guess, a, a national campaign to get these groups up and running. So so I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, Dan. It's, it's uh, thoroughly enjoyable, it's great, and appreciate your transparency with your figures, and it's not always easy for farmers to put some of that stuff up, so we, we do appreciate that. And, and there are lots of questions, though, uh, lots of uh, opportunity to ask what you wanted to know from Dan's presentation, so I'd like to just ask everyone just to show their appreciation now, please.